once we come to a conclusion about whether primates have pragmatics or not, the next question is how these pragmatics might be formed. And it's, it's, we're not quite clear on whether primates have pragmatics yet. Um, that's some uh, current research that is um, undergoing at the University of Kent at the moment. Um, I'm one of the people working on that project. Uh, my, com my contributions being Capuchinet primarily. Um, but if, if pragmatics are shown to be a mechanism through which uh, black tufted capuchins are responding differently to hiccup alarm calls in platform feeding contexts, then how is it that capuchins are able to make an association between a platform feeding context and the fact that a hiccup is more likely to be a false alarm signal? This is something that we have already covered in our first cognitive pragmatics video and that we are returning to um, because we're now going to be demonstrating the hippocampus function in Capuchinet that enables it to learn new memory associations between items of, of mnemonic coding. So what do I mean here? Well, because Hiccup activates several representations, this neuron here activates the Felid representation, the Snake representation, and the Capuchin representation, one has to wonder how it is that an, a signal in the environment comes to represent something in the first place. There are two answers, possible answer, answers to that question, and that is A, that the primate learns the association, that is the connection between hiccup and uh, felid, snake and capuchin, or to summarise, terrestrial predators is formed via learning during a, a period of strengthening of that connection. This is something called Hebbian plasticity, um, which occurs through the mechanism of long-term potentiation in biological nervous systems. And uh, we're going to cover that in, this, uh, in a bit in this video. But the other alternative is that um, a neuron can become strongly connected to another because it has been genetically pre-specified um, um, through some innate template or genetic mechanism that is selected for by natural selection. And there's been uh, quite a few arguments, um, in, in the case of Gapuchins at least, that the, the raptor alarm call, the bark alarm call, could be more of an innately specified mechanism. And the reasons for that are that it's a functionally referenced signal. Bark always means raptor in whatever context, which means that this signal has possibly mean, meant only one thing for, such a, uh, for, for potentially such a long time that it is given enough time for natural selection to, to select for this kind of neural network to be innately specified. And that is possible through... Um, a new field called EVO-DEVO, or Evolutionary and Developmental Biology, which is all about how genes um, co-activate each other in, in something that's a li little bit like a neural network itself, and that these co-activations set up concentration gradients of molecular signals in different regions of the developing embryo. And these regions um, co-suppress um, each other in certain areas and co-activate each other in others and this enables um, through through these morphog morphogen um, gradients it sets up almost like a spatial map if you will of coordinates of attractions and repulsions for other chemical signals which means if you have an axon like I've got I've clicked this neuron here and you've got axon and the axon's growing away from the neuron to synapse with the, another neuron say over here it's going to be 
um, attracted if the signals being given by that neuron in this position over here it's given off signals that are attractive to this axon then it's going to synapse with it if genes activated in this neuron are giving um, molecular signals off that repulse this neuron this neuron won't synapse with this because of the genetics going on in this neuron and so you can get a, a case where with a functionally referenced signal like Bark and Raptor it can be pre-specified what we're postulating with <clears throat> cognitive pragmatics is that it's more likely to be a learned association because the signal doesn't always concretely mean it's referent in every single context. Um, in humans a, a good example would be the sentence, oh would you mind giving me a hand? Well we, we obviously don't want the person to to pull off their their right forelimb or left forelimb and hand it to you, that would be utterly gross. We understand that in the context that someone is exerting themselves to get a job done and they're struggling if they say can you give me a hand it doesn't mean literally rip off your hand the context pragmatically dictates that you instead give them um, some help with whatever it is they're trying to achieve now that's something that you learn whilst you're in a culture and this is a bit like what um, capuchins may be doing in in feeding context is that they're learning to associate um, platform with the hiccup signal only meaning capuchin, like a, a, that a capuchin is giving it deceptively and that it doesn't mean a predator. So, in order to, to understand how we need to model this in this network and how it would actually occur in a real capuchin, we need to understand the mechanisms of Hebbian plasticity, which is how neurons that have made connections can strengthen those connections through learning and experience. So over here, this first picture we've got here to demonstrate this is a synaptic connection between neurons. So a neuron in the distance over here has got an axon with dendrites and these dendrites can synapse with several other neurons like we've got in our neural network and at the sites of these synapses there's chemicals neurotransmitters which are produced and go across this synaptic cleft and those neurotransmitters are ligand proteins that bond to receptors in the next neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, postsynaptic meaning post the gap, postsynapse, which when they bind enable um, ion molecules that are in the surrounding extracellular fluid, the fluid around the neuron, to enter and change the voltage of the neuron which eventually can lead to it sending a signal down its axon. In other words, this neuron sends a signal to this neuron, and if the signal's strong enough, this neuron will then send a signal to the next one. Okay, and that's once a synapse is formed. And how that synapse is formed is in this next image that I'm going to explain. So this is long-term potentiation, which is how uh, a neural network becomes plastic and can modify the strength of its connections to represent information. So LTP here is standing for long-term potentiation. So once again we've got a synapse. We've got a presynaptic neuron. So you can imagine the axon and the dendrite coming out here. This is the end of the dendrite. And this is the next neuron. And you can see it's got receptors in its membrane. And when this presynaptic neuron fires sends a signal down here. It um, enables calcium to enter the end of the neuron. This calcium sets off a chain reaction which makes these little vesicles, these uh, bubbles of neurotransmitter uh, fuse with the membrane here and release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. And these um, these dots are the neurotransmitters and they're excitatory which means they increase the likelihood that the postsynaptic neuron will fire. They excite the, this postsynaptic neuron 
and they do this by binding to these things here called AMPA receptors. The R stands for receptor here, AMPA receptor. So these glutamate neurotransmitters bind to these receptors and they open this gate, this receptor gate, which enables sodium in the extracellular fluid, which you can't see in this diagram, um, but just take it that it's there. It's, it's, it's sodium is, a, is uh, what you find in uh, table salt. So imagine the salt around here. And it enables sodium to enter the neuron. And because sodium is positively charged, and because there's more sodium on the outside than on the inside, the outside of the neuron is positively charged and the inside of the neuron is negatively charged. And when the sodium enters, because this neurotransmitter has enabled this receptor to open, it, it activates, the, it increases the, the voltage of the inside of the neuron and increases the probability that it will fire. So that's, that's fair enough. This neuron might activate this one. But how do we strengthen the connection between this presynaptic neuron and this postsynaptic neuron? Well, there's another type of receptor called NMDA and then the R being receptor, MDA receptor. And what this does is it, it also can um, be activated by these glutamate neurotransmitters, these excitatory neurotransmitters. Uh, but this guy is a bit more stubborn. Uh, he will not open uh, the gates. Uh, he's literally like Gandalf standing here going, you shall not pass! And... and the reason for that is he's actually got a magnesium ion on the inside of his receptor, which means this may bind to here, but this the magnesium ion inside will not enable the glutamate to enter. Okay, but what can shift the magnesium ion out is if Lots of these glutamate neurotransmitters are emitted from the presynaptic neuron, meaning that the signal going through here is very high, causing a lot of these neurotransmitters to come out. If that's the case, then the AMPA receptors will open and the voltage will increase even more in here. When this neuron is sending a lot of signals to the next neuron, the voltage will increase significantly. And when it gets up to a certain amount, the positive charge in this postsynaptic neuron will have an electrostatic repulsion effect upon the magnesium ion on the inside of this NMDA receptor. Because remember, positives rep repel each other. You'll probably remember that from playing with magnets as a child. But it will repulse the magnesium ion out so it will open the NMDA receptor and enable the ions to, to uh, a calcium ion this time to enter. Now NMDA enables calcium to enter the cell. And when calcium enters this neuron cell, it triggers off a chain reaction by binding to another molecule called calcium calmodulin kinase 2 or CAMK2. I like the sound of that. CAMK2. Um, and that will trigger the nucleus of the cell to make more a AMPA receptors, which means that you'll need less activation in the presynaptic neuron to activate the postsynaptic neuron. And that's what you're seeing here. The calcium on this side of this diagram, the NMDA receptor opened, enabled calcium to enter, and that caused a chain reaction that increased the AMPA receptors here. Notice there's one here, and then post-LTP, post-long-term potentiation, we have more receptors, which means that this postsynaptic neuron is more sensitive to the signals of the presynaptic neuron, which means it's more likely to fire. So if this neuron fires, this neuron fires. Um, a good way of, of thinking about this in a more intuitive way is thinking about revising for an exam. If I only revised a little bit, which, to be honest, is, is mostly the case with university students. But um, <laughs> I didn't say that. No one heard me say that. Um, but if you only revise a little bit, the presynaptic neuron only fires slightly, and it doesn't get to the point where this postsynaptic neuron 
can open its NMDA receptor so it doesn't strengthen the connection. So I don't retain that information because these neurons don't form a network that, that can compute whatever it is you're trying to revise. But if I revise for a long period of time, this presynaptic neuron will fire a lot and it will dislodge the magnesium ion from the NMDA receptor and it will increase the weight of the connection. And so you will then be able to learn everything. So the, the moral of this story is biologically, if you do your revision, you should be okay. Um, although, to be honest, I tend to blank in exams and that never matters. Uh, but back to Ka the, the black tufted capuchin, it's all fair and well. We, we're just talking about, we've just been talking about two neurons and strengthening the connections. But with um, capuchinet, we're talking about an auditory signal, which would be several neurons in this upper area of the temporal lobe here. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight here. This region here will, will have several hundreds of, of thousands of neurons in it. And uh, we're trying to connect them, the, the auditory neurons, which hear the alarm call, with uh, semantic concepts which are more likely to be here. We're dealing with way more than just one neuron. How do we get entire constellations of neurons to wire up, and in particular pathways of activation, which represent... Um, you know, things as complex as predators, food, platforms, alarm call signals. How do, how do we get that to wire up in such a way? Well, um, there is a specialised system in the brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is named after the, the Greek term uh, for seahorse. The ancient Greek term for seahorse, it's this region here which is, uh, if this is the temporal lobe, which I was just highlighting in, in the capuchin brain, if you were to peel back the temporal lobe, you'll find on the inside of the brain, the hippocampus. Um, to be honest, I don't think it looks that much like a seahorse, but you know, these neuroanatomists, uh, they obviously don't get out enough to see, horse, to see seahorses. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, we know that this region is important for memory function, and we've known it, known it since the 1940s when um, a patient called HM uh, had epileptic fits, and to treat those epileptic fits, they had this region um, removed, and whilst it got rid of his epileptic fits, it destroyed his ability to form new memories. So... You know, this is the guy you'd you'd go and meet, and you'd say, "Hi, um, my name's Andoni," and he'd say, "Nice to meet you. My name's Henry." And then, for example, um, someone would slam a door, and he'd turn round, look at the door, look it back at you, and then be like, "Oh, hi. I'm sorry, we haven't met before. My name's H.M." And it would, you know, this is a person who's trapped in the the, the few seconds of 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 online working memory in the moment. He only lives in the moment. He can't remember anything from second to second. Uh, sorry, from, from about a, a minute to minute. And that's because he doesn't have the hippocampus. In fact, um, HM uh, died, I think, in 2008. And uh, he'd been studied by neuroscientists for so long that his, he had his brain donated to neuroscience afterwards. And uh, you can actually find a video on YouTube of uh, one of the great neuroscientists today, Dr. V uh, v. R. Ramachandran, um, doing uh, cross-sections of HM's brain here um, for, for analysis. These are coronal cross-sections, so uh, these are like horizontal slices um, through the brain. Um, and about 100 neuroscientists watched this happening live and it was it's kind of like a in the memory of HM it was it was it was quite bizarre it was almost like a funeral but uh, um, this is what a coronal section looks like through the brain and uh, if this is like the the wrinkly bit on the outside that you usually see the gray matter and then this is the white matter that connects all the cortex if you come along the bottom of the temporal lobe here, you get to this squiggly bit, 
which uh, is that long tube-like thing which was the hippocampus that we were talking about. Um, this is a cross-section of what the hippocampus looks like. Um, and you see that it's basically a loop here. It's a loop that goes around this way and then you have a small little bit over here called the dentate gyrus which comes round back under here. And so signals coming from all over the cortex all funnel down into this, this region here called the entorhinal cortex which then feeds further along to this region called the subiculum and then up through here into this loop um, and because this this kind of loop bit here looks like a is curved like a, a ram's horn neuroscientists call it the the cornu ammonis um, for horn and then um, ammon is the Egyptian god for for with that had a ram's head so the the ram's horn if you will cornu ammonis and so that's the cornu ammonis region, which I'm going to be calling CA from now on, and that's what neuroscientists usually call it. Um, and then you've got the dentate gyrus here. And so information goes from the entorhinal cortex, perforates on into the, the dentate gyrus, and also to cornu ammonis region A, uh, 1, and then on to region 3. Now that sounds like a mouthful, but I'm going to go through the entire circuit because after all we want Capuchinet to to basically mimic how the hippocampus works. Right, so here we have um, radio staining of a, 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 a coronal section um, through through the hippocampus. And so what you're seeing here is the 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 loop here so we've got this is the ca region the cornu ammonis that that curves round and then you've got the dentate gyrus which is what this region is here and we can notice some things straight away that's interesting about how these neurons are actually linked up and that's if we go to ca3 region which is these neurons along this 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 bank here of the curve um these are the neuron cell bodies and then they've got their axons trailing off and these axons are connecting with other CA3 neurons and with themselves they're looping back onto themselves and they're they're connecting with each other okay and that's our first clue to what's going on in in the hippocampus that helps it generate memory and link various regions of the cortex which feed into this region together and then, interestingly, for the dentate gyrus, which is what these neurons are here, they're called the granule cells, because if you look, they look like grains. Um, they're called granulated neurons. And I've got another image here of, of the hippocampus, which, instead of showing you the axons for CA3, shows you the dentate gyrus, this area here, uh, better. So in the blue here, we've got the granule cell bodies and then you can actually see the the axons um, projecting away the connections from the, the the dentate gyrus back to CA3 up here and um, and so information comes from goes through the enter from the the neocortex up through, uh, sorry, down into the end, um, into the subiculum, and then comes along and perforates into this dentate gyrus. The dentate gyrus then feeds out into CA3, and then it goes um, back through the subiculum, back out to the cortex. Um, and it's it's quite difficult to make sense of it all when it's when it's like this, when it's all fuzzy in its biology, but. Uh, an amazing neuroscientist called John Lisman, Lisman in 1999 basically summarized this in a diagram in a way that's easier for you to make out what's going on. Easier, he says, when actually <laughs> at first look to, uh, to someone who, who hasn't done neuroscience, this might look a bit insane. But um, basically, information from the cortex 
flows in this direction, all right? And each one of these is, is, is a connection, a synapse. So if you can imagine up, up somewhere in the cortex, you've got one region that's encoding a hiccup signal for the, the sound of the hiccup for the, the capuchin. And in another region of the cortex, you've got some neurons which are coding for uh, a predator representation, for example. And that both of these are feeding down um, through here from the subiculum and interfacing with these light green neurons that, which are, are here. And these neurons are what we saw in the dentate gyrus, okay? And these neurons here as well, sorry, these, these neurons, the blue ones, the, are the, the dentate gyrus cells, the granule cells. And these little blobs here are, are the, the cell bodies, right? So the information comes here and causes these neurons to spike. Yeah, they send a, 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 an action potential out. And what you'll notice is these neurons project their axons in turn to CA3, these dark green cells, which is um, which is what we saw in the previous uh, image of the hippocampus, the, the, the bank along the top, the cornu ammonis. And uh, so if you can imagine, let's give, let's get, uh, give you an example. Um, you meet me and uh, I introduce myself and I say my name is Andoni. This neuron here in the granule cell could be receiving a connection about how I look, my face for example. And this neuron over here could be representing my name when I said hi, my name's Andoni. And if you want to make a some, uh, you want to learn something about, um, you know, you've got, you've got to put a name to a face. You've got to associate Andoni, my name, with my face. Um, this is what the the hippocampus is 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 likely designed to do. Um, so these neurons output to CA3. And remember what I said about CA3 neurons connecting with other CA3 neurons. We call this a, recu a recurrent connection, a recurrent loop. So you've got this neuron, which because this neuron here was my face, it's this first green cell which would be representing my face. And then this second blue cell was my name, this second green cell is going to be my name. The dentate gyrus does other functions, but I'm not going to go into them here because it's it's just unnecessary complexity at this point. So this neuron's representing my name, this neuron's representing my face. And if we look here and we follow the connections, this neuron for my face also synapses with the neuron representing my name. So if information was flowing um, from the dentate gyrus about these two separate events, um, my my face would trigger my name cell to activate, and my name cell would trigger my face cell to activate. And because this is a recurrent loop, it, it self amplifies. You know, the more this neuron fires, the more that neuron fires, and the more that neuron fires, the more this neuron fires. Which, if if you recall what I've just talked about with long term potentiation, um, the more the the cell fires, the stronger the connection becomes between those two neurons. Um, and so you, you you get a network forming which represents new information. So you strengthen the connection, and that's what Capuchinet needs to do if it's going to learn an association between a hiccup alarm call and a predator, or a hiccup alarm call and a feeding platform, and the the probability of that alarm call not being true, being a false alarm call. Okay, and then CA three neurons as well as projecting to themselves, project to CA1 neurons, which are further up in the cornu ammonis loop. And then they output to the subiculum and back into the cortex. And because this is like a compressed version of the cortex, if you will, um, the information cut flows in separately, it gets linked, and it outputs to the cortex. It means that ne the, these neurons being connected here, when they output to the cortex, they make, they make the constellation of neurons involved in like my, my face and my name 
fire together. And because of what we just showed with LTP, neurons that fire together, wire together, the association between my name and my face will, will become permanent. Um, and, and that's basically what this rule is, and what the hippocampus is trying to achieve. Neurons that fire together, wire together, and neurons that don't fire together, don't wire together. So if, if this presynaptic neuron fired and the postsynaptic neuron didn't fire because there wasn't enough neurotransmitter to knock the, the magnesium um, ion outside of this NMDA receptor, it wouldn't strengthen the connection and the, the, the connection just eventually dies out. So without further ado, we're now going to discuss how we build this hippocampus system um, into our capuchinet. Another thing to mention is that um, the way this hippocampus, once the, these CA3 neurons have made their connections stronger, they don't project to the cortex immediately all the time. What often happens is they project the, this connectedness between um, two, two memories, um, the auto-association between two parts of a memory, which is what this process is called, auto-association. It, it tends to send these, this audio association between my name and my face when you go to sleep, when you're in uh, sleep. And this is, might be the reason why we have dreams. And, um, and it's been shown in, in rats that after they've been placed in a new cage and they've learned new positions in the cage, when they go to sleep, the hippocampus fires up to consolidate the connections within the cortex. What is this going to look like in Capuchinet? Well, bringing up Capuchinet again, um, what I'm going to demonstrate now is that initially we, we, could, we could imagine a case where Hiccup has not um, had its strength, uh, its connections between uh, predators strengthened yet, for example. What would, what would this look like in Capuchinet? Well, you can see that the neurons are connected, but it should be that at this synapse there isn't enough NMDA, uh, there isn't enough AMPA receptors, such that if this neuron fires, it won't have enough stronger connection to make this neuron fire, which is the same as the hiccup, the association between hiccup sound and um, snake in this case, felid and capuchin, um, they shouldn't fire. So let's give it a try. We're going to play the hiccup alarm call signal through the system. So there, we saw that the neuron fired and it sent the signal along its axons, but it didn't cause any of these neurons to fire, which is what you'd expect because the capuchinet, and in this case it's modeling a capuchin, the capuchin itself hasn't learned the association between a hiccup alarm call and a predator, right? So what the hippocampus needs to do is, is um, if it hears a hiccup alarm call and it sees a, a predator, um, for example, a felid, so we can activate felid neuron separately and it activates an escape response in the capuchin or in, in capuchinet. But what we need to do is get into a state where if these neurons fire together, that's um, the capuchin is in, in, is, is in a scenario in which it sees a felis and another capuchin makes an alarm call, a hiccup alarm call. Both neurons fire and that goes down into the hippocampus and strengthens the connection between the two then it comes back, the signal comes back up out of the hippocampus and makes these neurons fire together um, repeatedly to make the, the neurons wire together, right? We need the neurons to fire together for them to wire together. I'm going to reset the dynamics of this network so the capuchin stops running. Bless it, it will get exhausted otherwise. Right, in fact, you can hear my fan has just started running higher on my computer because of the processing going on. Right, so this is the artificial hippocampus. 
So remember, we had the dentate gyrus. All the all the, the information from the cortex flowed down the cortex, uh, the outer layer of the cortex, and it went down into the the entorhinal cortex and the subiculum, which is what these connections are, are representing here. Sorry, these ones here, like that. And then they enter the dentate gyrus through the perforant path, and then the dentate gyrus sends its, sig its um, signals, its representations, out into the CA3, the Cornu Ammonis Area 3 um, region, via a connection, connections called the Schaefer collaterals. And so you've got hippocampus cells, um, the hippocampus CA3 cells. And these are the ones that had the recurrent connections. And this is why, if you look here, Every neuron is connected to other neurons and itself. It's, it looks quite elaborate, I know. Um, so let's let's go through this diagram. So for the rap, raptor alarm call, which is the bark call, it would activate this neuron here. It feeds the bark neuron feeds into this first neuron in the dentate gyrus. So there's like a one-to-one -one correlation here. The hiccup call responds to this neuron, felid responds to this neuron, sorry, that's raptor, the raptor neuron responds to, uh, is connected to this neuron in the dentate gyrus, felid, snake, feeding platform, and capuchin. So you can see that neurons in the dentate gyrus are receiving um, equivalent information as to what's going on in the cortex. In a real brain this would be more complex and it would it compresses, the dentate gyrus tends to compress the information that comes into it into a, um, a simplified form and then it also clears up some of the information and uh, does pattern separation to stop different patterns of activation in the cortex getting confused but you know this is a simple 255 uh, neuron a neural network. We don't need to worry about it at, th at this point yet. And then the dentate gyrus projects out into the CA3 neurons and this is where according to uh, what we know in contemporary neuroscience the magic's going to happen um, because of the the recurrent connections. But at this point the, there hasn't been any scenario, there's been no activation and so these connections are I haven't been strengthened yet. Um, and for the neural network, I um, if I take this connection for example, what I did was I decreased the connection strength by, reduce it, uh, by reducing the maximum current going through that connection to uh, zero amps, na zero nano, nano amps, which is basically how we simulate uh, there being very reduced amper receptors in the cell membrane of the of the postsynaptic neuron. So basically these connections have zero weight to them and the only way we can increase the weight is by getting neurons to fire together and wire together. So if, if we look here and I press the hiccup alarm call we should see that the hiccup neuron activates this neuron should activate and this neuron should activate and send signals out to all of these neurons but that none of them should fire because it needs coincidence of at least two neurons to firing to make a connection between them so here we go we're gonna fire up the hiccup alarm call